choose texts that focus on themes or topics that are really um, uh, that are really resonant with them. And for that purpose, um, I uh, today I will be focusing on teaching fiction, um, on the importance of providing um, context so that our students can get the most out of um, uh, what they read. And the the text, uh, the topic that I've chosen for today uh, is immigrant literature. Um, and so um, uh, we know that uh, America has often been called um, a nation of immigrants. Um, and so there are so many uh, 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 topics and themes uh, relating to immigrant literature that resonate with our students. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, a quote by Salman Rushdie, um, uh, renowned author of Midnight's Children. And in an essay in Imaginary Homelands, he says that um, America is a nation of immigrants um, and uh, has created a great literature out of the phenomenon of cultural transplantation, out of examining the ways in which people cope with a new world. Um, another very relevant quote from Patricia Engel, who is a Colombian American um, author, uh, is all immigrants are artists because they create a life, a future from nothing but a dream. And I think this is uh, really important for us because we are looking at creative work, we are looking at literature, um, and uh, also thinking about the fact that immigrants create their own life and future. Um, so when you're talking about immigrant literature, about migration, um, it's important to uh, provide um, definitions of the terms. Um, so one of the things that uh, should be defined is that migration means people moving from one land, uh, uh, their homeland, their land of origin, to another, their host land, uh, host land a new country. Um, and uh, mass or forced migrations have happened due to a variety of reasons, um, war, persecution, famine, and other natural disasters um, that have led people to um, look for new places to live and to survive in, um, and also due to uh, movements such as colonial, colonialism, slavery, and indentured labor. People also choose to migrate to seek a better life, uh, more opportunities and resources, um, uh, and a better education, a higher standard of living. And uh, Gayatri Spivak um, ha has called uh, this kind of movement when you're uh, moving for to seek a better life, economic migration. Um, there are also lots of terms that are used interchangeably um, uh, for migrants. Uh, they're called exiles, expatriates, refugees, asylum seekers, and diasporics. Now the term diaspora, um, uh, it's Greek for scattering as of seeds. Um, and um, originally, as William Safran has pointed out, diaspora was used for the Jewish diaspora, and there were very particular definitions of what it meant to be in that diaspora. Uh, for a group of people to move from the original homeland to a host land, um, to try to maintain, preserve that culture, um, and also patrol its borders so that everybody had those ties to the homeland, the original homeland. But now uh, the word diaspora and diasporics are used, uh, as I said, interchangeably for all kinds of uh, migrants, not just people who move as a group. So today, for today's presentation, I'm looking at two Indian American uh, writers, immigrant writers. And the first is Chitra Divakaruni. Um, and uh, she was born in Calcutta, India. Uh, she came to the United States for graduate studies, which means that she's an economic migrant. Um, she teaches at the University of Houston, and she's the winner of the American Book Award and numerous other awards. Um, and um, the next writer whose work I'm looking at is Jhumpa Lahiri. Uh, she was born in London um, and lived in the United States since she was um, uh, two. Um, and she teaches creative writing at Princeton and uh, among the awards that she has won, she's also won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Um, so 
before we get into the, the works, we want to also talk about the context. I mean, it's really important to provide context and terminology for students. Um, and in this case, we want to look at issues um, uh, that arise for first generation immigrants who are the people who actually move from one country to the other and for second generation immigrants who are the children of the first generation immigrants. So one of the uh, issues that arise for um, uh, immigrants, particularly first generation immigrants, is the idea of negotiation um, between the need to assimilate and to adapt to the host land, which you have to do in order to survive in the host land, and the desire to preserve the culture and tradition of the homeland. Uh, they don't want to feel that they have abandoned their original culture and tradition. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a compromise, that's a dance that they have to make, a balance that they have to try to achieve. And one of the issues that, uh, um, some of the issues that come up for first generation immigrants include disorientation and confusion. Um, the idea that they're not familiar sometimes with the language of the host land, uh, the, the cultural mores, uh, the protocols of the, the host land. Um, they also deal with homesickness, loss of status. They might have been professionals back in their uh, host, uh, homeland, but now they are uh, trying to find jobs, trying to make ends meet. Culture shock, everything seems to be different. And of course, nostalgia yearning for what they have left behind. And in terms of second generation uh, immigrants, um, who are the children uh, of the, the uh, migrants uh, who have moved, um, they have to straddle between cultures. Um, they, they might have a double life, an ethnic private life where they are um, uh, upholding the traditions of their parents, uh, speaking the language of their parents' homeland, uh, but then they have an American public life, they're switching, they're code switching. And as a result of this double life, uh, they might have a divided identity. Uh, they're not sure uh, where their affiliations are. And both first and second generation and even third generation immigrants might face discrimination, prejudice and racism. Um, so the first story um, that I want to talk about is uh, Mrs. Dutta writes a letter by Chitra Divakaruni. Um, and it was first published in The Atlantic in 1998. And I'm going to do a little bit of a Vanna White here. Uh, uh, this is the collection, um, The Unknown Errors of Our Lives from which this story is taken. And Mrs. Dutta writes a letter, um, focuses on um, an older woman, uh, a more mature woman um, who is a um, a widowed grandmother uh, whose only child uh, and his family live in the United States and she's back in India. And after an illness, she realizes that she wants to be needed. Um, and she decides to move from her home in Calcutta to California um, to be with her son and family. Um, so I find that maps are useful uh, just to get an idea of, for the students to get an idea of uh, where places are, where characters are moving back and forth. So Mrs. Dutta has moved from Calcutta uh, in India to California uh, to be with her son. And context that should be provided uh, has to do with cultural differences. When we are talking about intercultural differences, this is happening within uh, uh, the son's home for Mrs. Dutta, right? She is used to a joint family system where generations of a particular family live together in the same household. And now she's uh, dealing with um, a nuclear family in her ho son's household. Um, she is an adherent of Hinduism um, uh, and um, so she uh, misses that kind of aspect uh, in her new home. Uh, Jonathan Boyerin has said, we remind ourselves of what we are by reminding ourselves of what we miss. And this is especially the case with uh, an immigrant like Mrs. Dutta, who's uh, always thinking about what she's missing. Um, another thing that we need to keep in mind is about language. Ingu Viwatiango, who's the famous Kenyan writer, has said language carries culture. Language is not just about communication, but our culture and our traditions are embedded. Uh, what we value is embedded in the language that we speak. 
So linguistic differences come into play um, in this short story. Um, Mrs. Dutta has problems because she didn't fully understand the word privacy because there was no such term in her language, Bengali. So she doesn't understand, for example, why her grandchildren um, shut their doors, their bedroom doors and keep her out. Um, so apart from uh, cultural differences, there are also intergenerational conflicts going on. Um, and then um, something else that she has a hard time with is uh, uh, getting used to what's going on in her son's household and her references are to what she's familiar with. So at one point when she sees her son and his wife uh, having a moment of PDA, um, uh, she feels embarrassed. And in the story, it says that she wishes the ground would open up and swallow her like the Sita of mythology. So uh, this reference is, of course, to the Ramayana, the story of uh, Rama and his wife Sita, which is a Sanskrit epic. Um, so one thing that would be helpful to students is to show them uh, images um, like these two, which um, show Sita and her husband Ram, Rama, um, and maybe talk about uh, the, the story uh, that this depicts. Um, in, the, in this short story, um, one of the most important points is about the migrant's double vision. Um, Edward Said, in Reflections on Exile and other essays, has talked about how most people are principally aware of one culture, one setting, one home. Exiles are aware of at least two and this plurality of vision gives rise to an awareness of simultaneous dimensions, an awareness that, to borrow a phrase from music, is contrapuntal. For an exile, habits of life, expression, or activity in the new environment inevitably occur against the memory of these things in another environment. Thus, both the new and the old environments are vivid, actual, occurring together contrapuntally. This is an advantage, according to Saeed, the fact that a migrant has double vision. The migrant is not just focusing on the culture that they are used to, but they're being exposed to a, a new, unfamiliar, different culture, which enables the migrant to uh, consider the, uh, the pros and the cons of the culture, cultures uh, uh, together. Uh, R. Radhakrishnan has also talked about this. He says immigrants experience distance as a form of healthy estrangement from their birthland and a reprieve from the orthodoxies of their own given cultures. Um, this means that um, immigrants are able to have some kind of um, uh, new self uh, to change based on uh, the experiences of the old and new culture. And this is what happens in Mrs. Dutta. You see this double vision in this woman, this main character. At the beginning, she looks at what's happening with, in her son's household in the United States, and she's critical, um, particularly of her daughter-in-law. She says, women need to be strong, not react to every little thing like this. Um, and she talks about how we had far worse to cry about, but we shed tears invisibly. We were good wives and daughters-in-law, good mothers, dutiful, uncomplaining, never putting ourselves first. And then after her uh, experience in her son's household, um, she begins to question that. She says, and what good did it do? The more we bent, the more people pushed us until one day we'd forgotten that we could stand up straight. Maybe her daughter-in-law, Shyamali, the one with, was the one with the right idea after all. So this means that um, Mrs. Dutta uh, begins to reconsider some of her own loyalties and some of her own decisions. She came to the United States because in her culture, um, a, son, uh, a mother's place, particularly a, a widowed mother's place was with her son. That's why she came. She was being dutiful. She was doing what she was thought she was supposed to do. But after her experience in the United States and acquiring this double vision, she questions that and she decides, I don't want to be here. I would prefer to be back in my own household, back in India. And so she makes a decision to move. Um, so this is a way in which she grows and develops as a character and becomes more uh, empowered. Um, so the next story, is that I want to talk about is Mr. Pirzada Comes to Dine by Jim, Jumpa Lahiri. Um, and this is from her Pulitzer Prize winning collection, Interpreter of Maladies. 
Um, and um, so uh, in, the, in, the first, in the first story, the perspective that we got was from the grandmother, uh, the more mature woman, uh, Mrs. Dutta. In this second story, um, the focus is, the perspective is of a 10 year old girl, um, uh, the daughter of uh, immigrants from India. Um, and uh, she, so she is a second generation um, immigrant and uh, she lives on the East Coast with her parents. And the story revolves around um, her parents uh, inviting uh, a guest, uh, Mr. Pirzada, who comes regularly to have dinner with the parents and to um, watch the news on TV uh, with which he is obsessed, particularly about uh, his home country. Um, and the 10 year old girl, um, uh, she, uh, she calls uh, Mr. Pirzada an Indian. She refers to him as an Indian. And her father corrects her and says, Mr. Pirzada is no longer considered an Indian, not since partition. Our country was divided in 1947. And this makes no sense to the little girl. She says, Mr. Pirzada and my parents spoke the same language, laughed at the same jokes, looked more or less the same. So how can he not be an Indian is what um, uh, the little girl is thinking. Um, and at this point, um, we need to provide some context uh, about uh, what's going on in the story. Um, the context has to do with shifting borders due to colonialism, independence, and partition. Now, uh, the partition of India happened in 1947. And again, I'm using maps, as you can see. Um, the, first, the first map shows India in 1945, uh, while it was still a colony of uh, uh, the British, um, and then in 1947, um, the, the British, before they left uh, India um, and gave independence to India, um, they divided the country. So partition meant the dividing of the Indian subcontinent. Um, uh, the, the British had ruled with a divide and rule policy. Um, so tensions between the Hindus and Muslims of India had been exacerbated during British rule. And um, the, as a result, there was a clamor um, from some groups uh, to, to divide the country. Um, and the British did it in a very um, haphazard, uh, sudden way. Um, so the subcontinent was divided in 1947 into two countries, India, which was a secular uh, country with a, um, with a uh, predominant uh, uh, Hindu uh, population, and then uh, Pakistan, which was created as an Islamic state, uh, uh, predominantly for Muslims. Um, one thing that you will notice about this map is that uh, when you look at India and Pakistan, you see that Pakistan um, is in two different places, um, uh, West Pakistan um, and East Pakistan. So you have a country um, of Pakistan with a thousand miles of India in between. It's almost like an India sandwich, right? Um, so if I tell my students, if you think about um, California and Connecticut being one country, uh, that would cause problems because there's so much um, uh, difference and distance between the two halves of the same country. So in 1947, you had the partition of India um, that created uh, the new country of Pakistan. Um, and um, uh, as decades went by, um, uh, there were tensions between uh, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, which led to a war in 1971, um, and there are some uh, reasons for, uh, for this war. Um, uh, West Pakistan dominated over East Pakistan. Uh, they had political power and military might. Um, uh, East Pakistan felt that they were economically exploited by West Pakistan. Uh, supremacy in Pakistan was given to Urdu, which was the language prevalent in West Pakistan, over Bengali, which was the language prevalent in East Pakistan. And there was a lack of aid for East Pakistan after uh, a devastating cyclone in 1970. And then most crucially, 
um, when there was an election in Pakistan and the leader of East Pakistan um, won, got a landslide victory, he was not allowed to be prime minister of Pakistan. So as a result of these factors, um, East Pakistan decided to secede from West Pakistan and create uh, another new nation uh, uh, called Bangladesh. And this is what led to the Bangladeshi War of Independence in 1971. And I like to show my students um, uh, some of the, the images from, uh, from that period, uh, from newspaper clippings and so on. Um, so another thing that uh, in terms of context to understand the timeline of the war, it's good to uh, just mention uh, the, the major um, events of the war. The war lasted nine, nine months uh, from March of 1971 um, until uh, December of 1971. Um, there was a declaration of independence from Bangladesh, the declaration of a new country, um, uh, which led to uh, massacres uh, uh, in Pakistan, uh, in uh, East Pakistan slash Bangladesh by the Pakistani army. Refugees started flooding India. Um, there was Bangladeshi resistance. Um, India supported Bangladesh in this conflict. Um, and as the narrator says, the United States supported Pakistan. Um, India declared war, war on Pakistan and then the war ended uh, with the creation of this new country of Bangladesh. Um, now, the reason why Mr. Pirzada comes over every, um, every day to dine with uh, the little girl's parents is because um, his wife and family have been left behind in Bangladesh um, and he's worried about them. He has no news of them. And so he comes over to get some support from his new friends, uh, the little girl's parents. Um, and they all watch the news together, whatever coverage is given uh, to the Bangladeshi War of Independence. Um, and at the same time, um, the little girl in school is learning about the American War of Independence. There's a quote in the story. We made dioramas depicting George Washington crossing the choppy waters of the Delaware River. And of course, another image that I like to provide my students is Washington crossing the Delaware, um, which is uh, an 1851 uh, painting by Emmanuel Leutzer. Um, so uh, the, the little girl is very familiar with the American War of Independence because that's what she's been learning uh, in his, for history. Um, and, uh, and then she's hearing about um, this other War of Independence that's going on at the same time. So what does Mr. Prisada bring um, to the little girl? Um, through his situation, um, through his concern for his wife and children and for this uh, uh, country fighting for independence, um, he brings the little girl an awareness of global politics and history. Um, the little girl is learning about American history and she's learning about uh, global politics and wars that are going on elsewhere. There's also an element of cultural translation um, the little girl is able to tell Mr. Pirzada about American traditions like Halloween. Most importantly, uh, Mr. Um, Pirzada and his situation and the little girl's encounter with him enables her to gain some empathy. Now, what do we mean by empathy? Um, it's not sympathy. It's not when we feel sorry for someone. According to um, uh, Suzanne Keane, Empathy is when we feel what we think other people feel in certain situations. And um, in many ways, um, empathy is what we hope to have when we read a work of literature, right? And this is the kind of um, empathy that is created within this story uh, by, the little, uh, by the little girl for Mr. Pirzada. Um, there's a quote, my stomach tightened as I worried whether his wife and seven daughters were not members of the drifting, clamoring crowd that had flashed at intervals on the screen. Um, she prays that Mr. Pirzada's family remains safe and sound. And once Mr. Pirzada is able to return to his country, she thinks 
though I had not seen him for months, it was only then that I felt Mr. Pilsada's absence. It was only then that I knew what it meant to miss someone who was so many miles away and hours away, just as he had missed his wife and daughters for so many months. So um, I think uh, that the little girl is able to gain empathy, to feel what she thinks Mr. Pirzada is feeling uh, in going through this terrible situation of being separated from his wife and family while a war was going on and she, he doesn't know whether his family is safe. Um, and the kind of empathy that we hope to create in our students um, as they are um, uh, reading um, about situations that in certain ways might not be familiar to them. Um, so ways to provide context, as I said, maps are really important. Um, I always make sure uh, to uh, provide maps for students so that they know exactly where things are located. Images, um, artwork uh, that you can incorporate, um, as I uh, showed you the, the image of the Ramayana um, or Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, those are important to incorporate and to have discussions about um, why such images are being mentioned in the particular story. Film clips are also um, uh, helpful. So for example, um, Jhumpa Lahiri, she wrote a novel called The Namesake, which has been adapted into a film directed by Mira Nair. Um, and that deals with the conflict between first and second generation um, uh, immigrants, uh, particularly Bengali immigrants. So showing um, a clip of the namesake is helpful. Um, there are also lots of um, uh, TV shows um, right now. For example, um, uh, on Netflix, there's a, there's a new series called Never Have I Ever. Uh, and that deals with uh, uh, the tensions between first and second generation immigrants. So that's something that you could also refer your students to, to understand uh, uh, the difficulties uh, or circumstances of immigrants. Author interviews are helpful uh, as well. And there are lots of clips on YouTube these days. Um, something else that I ask students to do is when they read uh, to figure out what words and terms are unfamiliar to them and then try to make their own glossary. That way you're empowering students to actually um, find out information that they can share uh, with uh, a group or with the whole class um, that will enable them to get more context out of what they're reading. Um, I also ask students to find newspaper articles and news items from the time. There are such good clips and um, uh, documentaries about uh, uh, things like the uh, war of Bangladesh, for example, the uh, war of independence uh, in Bangladesh. Um, so that could be something that you could uh, use. Um, I also want to uh, mention other works about, about immigration that might be helpful. Um, uh, there, there's a, there's a, a big selection um, uh, available. Um, I've provided some short stories, um, examples of short stories here uh, by Rashti, uh, by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda uh, Adichie, um, by the uh, Chinese American writer Jis Chen, Amy Tan, um, Edwidge Danticat. Um, so um, uh, there's also there are also poems that you can use that you can pair up with um, the short stories that I've mentioned. Assimilation is a poem by Filipino American writer Eugene Gloria, which is really um, uh, touching and poignant um, and talks about um, uh, what it means to, to grow up as a second generation immigrant whose uh, mother is packing um, rice for uh, lunch um, and how embarrassed the, the, the speaker feels about it um, when he opens it up and he finds that his lunch is different and he's yearning for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches um, and, and he throws away that rice um, and later on, as, a, as an adult, he feels sad that he did that um, as he tried to assimilate. Uh, um, and another, um, uh, another poem that you could uh, uh, teach uh, along with these stories would be Translation for Mama uh, by uh, Richard Blanco. Um, and I also have longer works about immigration, um, a variety of um, novels um, that 
might be helpful, including uh, uh, graphic novels uh, like uh, Vietnam America um, that students uh, that are very popular with, uh, with students. Um, so those are some of the ways in which um, I teach um, uh, about immigration um, and uh, and they really this really resonates with uh, the students they have uh, I, I, I teach on the border and a lot of students ask about um, issues of language um, what their parents experienced uh, in terms of which language they had to use uh, or learned in school um, so uh, there's a lot of discussion that happens as a result um, of uh, teaching stories like this. Um, so I think, I think um, I'm uh, done with the, the main presentation um, and I look forward to your, to your questions.